Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's go to the workshop two, microbiology concepts and detection techniques. And uh, this section is concepts and detection techniques one. And uh, it was a little change. Dr. Natalia, we're going next to, next to Dr. William Snelling. And his presentation is MES2, detection technique, introduction and laboratory practice. The microphone is yours. Okay, so uh, sorry, this one's uh, shot cutting sequencing. The MS2 is the next one after Natalia. So basically, this is a method. One of the things in the kickoff uh, meeting in February 2018, um, Anne and Fermin from Contour Azul, basically, one of the things they said to us is we'd love to know what's in our water. So that kind of stuck with us. And in the background, um, myself, and Nigel and James, and a few collaborations, and then Hector and Annie from Couturazel have been working on this. So, basically, this fancy title is just a way of applying DNA sequencing to know what's in water in rural regions within um, Chappas. So, just a wee bit of background. Um, basically, uh, microbial water quality relies on culture-based, meaning coliform uh, monitoring. It's very important, and generally, it works uh, very well when applied properly. But these are indicator bacteria, and we don't know what pathogens are actually there. Yes, it can correlate with them, but we still don't know what ones are there. Um, water contains mixed microbial um, communities and cultures and you cannot grow everything and try and detect everything. Um, so within the last 10 years or so, NGS or high three throughput um, sequencing technologies have developed. Um, you don't just detect specific microbes. Um, you can detect a lot, if not all the microbes. Uh, depending on the technique you choose in your budget. Um, most of these are PCR based, for example, 16S for bacteria. But more recently, shotgun sequencing, that's basically where you sequence fragments of DNA and you try and analyze as much as you can that's there. It's not just bacteria, it could be fungi and yeast and protozoa as well, and also viruses too. However, traditional methods of these are limited by the read length. So basically, it would be good if you had a technique where you could analyze longer fragments of DNA. Think of it as a bit like um, a fingerprint, and um, you're trying to identify the sequence of a fingerprint. You break it up into small fragments, and then a program puts it back together again. Well, it's basically easier to put the fingerprint back together again if it's bigger fragments and it's more accurate. You get better microbial identification. So traditional DNA sequencing relies on a, a large instrument that has a high capital cost and you send your DNA sequence away and then you get your identity back a few days or maybe a few weeks later depending on your sample number. So um, that is a minion which uh, Hector and now has a contour as well. And you can see from the description, so we were trying to apply the application to safe water. So we want it to be fast, easy to use and accurate, user friendly, which it is. It's a bit like drop down menus and you click what you want, which I'll show later. Portable, which you can see it's about the size of a small mobile phone or a stapler. And you get real time quality control monitoring. This basically means you know if it's working from within three minutes into the reaction. So you can stop it if it looks bad and just basically not waste your time and energy with it or consumables. So it's quite powerful and although it's small, you get lots and lots of information. Okay. So, next one. so basically that top uh, number there, that's just the maximum size of DNA that it, that it can read. So basically, microbes are 
they consist of uh, DNA molecules, or consist of DNA, and they have unique sequences. So if you can read that, we know what they are. Okay, because of the bigger fragments, you basically identify them more accurately. You do not just take, detect bacteria if you use shotgun sequencing because you haven't just amplified up bacterial genes. You have an overall population profile. And one of the things is the technology and the accuracy is improving all the time. It's been validated by uh, world-class scientists like Craig Venter and Venter Institute, etc. You work with um, flow cells as well that go inside the minion. So those are disposable flow cells and they're actually part of your uh, consumables. So you'll see how to load that again in a few minutes time, but it's very, very easy and user friendly. So we're just gonna go through the actual steps. So actually the hardest part of this whole process for Hector and Contorazo is the sample collection. You have to drive miles to get the sample. Um, one of the things as well is you need enough DNA. So I'll talk about the sample analysis and our plan we're gonna do, but you need about uh, 50 nanograms per microliter, which is quite a lot. So clean water, you'd have to filter a lot of it, whereas uh, more turbid water, uh, you will get that amount of DNA. So one of the other things we're gonna do to correlate with the MinION um, sequencing is water quality data, coliform monitoring, et cetera. So there's correlations there too. And I'll talk about that and the plan as well. So the next step is uh, membrane filtration. So basically, you see there, the membrane captures the bugs, the bugs stay, and then the water washes through. So your microbial population, is on the filter. Um, because of water turbidity, that's the pore size we're using, so you won't um, capture very small viruses there. And that material, PVDF, minimizes DNA binding. So basically, during your extraction, the DNA comes off the filter. One of the things we wanted was a flexible approach, so we chose a particular kiagen kit um, with this, you can filter your water samples and then freeze them and then analyze them whenever it's convenient for you. Uh, so you can freeze them and then do your DNA extraction and analyze them. And it's, you know, you can be flexible with your procedure, which is important for us. It's important as well that you fold the filters in half inwards and then place them in a sample tube and use sterile tweezers. So basically, your microbial community is now in your filter, and you can store it away safely after membrane filtration, uh, as long as it's at least minus 20 for a long time. So this is the most important part, um, the DNA extraction, and that you basically have good quality DNA. Um, that is absolutely key. One of the bonuses that we have is that Ulster University and Ecosur, who uh, Kantaras will collaborate with, both have agros electrophoresis. Now that's basically a technique where you run DNA in a gel. DNA is negative and it runs towards a positive. And you stain it and you can see the DNA that's there. That's what that wee cartoon is at the bottom. And then a nanodrop probe is a quality control method of knowing the purity of your DNA and also you can quantify it too. So we're fortunate in that before this project was designed and we started it, Ulster University and Ecosur already had agrose gel electrophoresis and the nanodrop. The nanodrop, um, it's nice to have, but it's not essential. So you, if you just have agrose gel electrophoresis, you can still do it and quantify, semi-quantify your DNA and know it's there. It's also very, very important to follow your kit protocol. That sounds very obvious, but for example, you would process as well six samples at a time. So that's a vortex that you basically put an adapter on and insert the tubes which the membranes are in. 
and you shake that for five minutes and only five minutes because if you go over that, you risk sharing your DNA so much. You, you will share it too much and the DNA fragments will be smaller and you don't want that. You want larger DNA fragments that are less broken up. So, um, barcode labeling and sample prep. So once you've done your DNA sample, your DNA extraction and your quality control, um, you, you basically label each individual sample. Now these are done as well as options within the kit to do many samples or up to blocks of 12. We've decided to do blocks of 12 because it's easier for Hector and Katora Azul to do less samples in more blocks just to fit in with the workload. Um, so basically you literally, you need a PCR thermocycler as well, which again, Ecosur and also University have. And barcode just means labeling. So you basically just uh, add an individual barcode to each sample. It becomes effectively stained with that, so it's recognized by the sequencer. And then you pull all the samples together. And there's an important uh, cleanup step as well that's recommended. Magnetic beads are essential. That improves the purity and the concentration of your DNA after you've labeled it. So that's important as well. Hi, I'm Tim and my student, Connor. So today, uh, we would like to show you how to load a frozen. So Connor, how many steps? There's three main steps. The first step is to remove any air bubble that's in the priming port. The second step is to prime the cell with the loading buffer. And the third step is then to load your sample. So in order to do the first step, we have to remove the cover from the priming port seen here. Now, in order to drop the bubble that, that is there in the port, we'll take our P1000, we'll put the tip right into the port, and then we'll turn the dial in order to drop just a few microliters of buffer. And that should have gotten the bubble out there from the port. So then we set our pipette min to 800 microliters, and we take 800 microliters of the loading buffer and we add that to prime the cell. Now it's really important in this step to make sure we don't introduce any bubbles into the system. And as I slowly load this, you'll see the color here in the cell slowly change from yellow to clear. Now we have to wait five minutes. After the five minutes has elapsed, set our pipette min to 200 microliters, and then open the spot on cover that is covering up the loading port here. Now we take 200 microliters of buffer, and we're going to slowly add it to the, the, the priming port here in the same manner we did the 800 microliters of buffer taking care not to introduce any bubbles now as we slowly load this in we'll see buffer rise and fall again here at the loading port make sure you load this buffer very slowly so that this buffer doesn't spill out all over the port here The next step, you take your, your P200 and you'll set it to 75 microliters to load your sample. Make sure you do this very quickly after this step. If you wait too long, it, the uh, sample will fail to load properly. Now, you must make sure your sample is mixed up. The beads have to be evenly distributed through the solution instead of settled at the bottom. So take your sample and you will add it drop wise into the priming port making sure each drop sinks into the port before you add the next one and as you do this the library is being distributed across the flow cell 
And after you do that, you close the spot on port. You close the priming port. And now your library is prepared and the cell is ready for sequencing. Okay, great job, Connor. Thank you. Now you know how to load an Oxford Nano Pore Flow cell. So that's basically it. So that 75 microliters we're going to use will have the 10 samples all barcoded, pulled together. You load in the min ion and you basically press go. That's it. So this is a very brief explanation of how it works. Four DNA bases. Basically, each there's a pore with there's pores within the membrane of that flow cell. Each DNA base passes through the membrane and gives it off a slightly different electrical signal. That's basically it. So the electrical signals are read in real time. So from that DNA and the code, you basically know the identity of your microorganisms. So, and then basically finally, this is the software. So there's Oxford Nanopore software. It's called EPI2MO, 2ME, sorry. So what's on my pot is what you use for shotgun sequencing. Um, there's different quality scores you can use. So from talking to Oxford Nanopore and collaborators, we are going to use a quality score of nine just to improve the accuracy of the testing. But then also you need um, bioinformatics analysis. And you'll see from our sampling plan, we want to be able to disc discriminate between more than 10 samples. And if you want to do that, you need uh, bioinformatics, but we have collaborators um, for that as well. So I'll mention who they are just at the end too. So, so basically this is a real-time quality control. So each one of those pixels there is a pore. Now if you had that at the start of your reaction, you'd be very worried. That's at the end. So um, you want that full of green, and green means green is good. Basically, that means you're getting good quality DNA. You can see that after three minutes of pressing go on your laptop. You see lots of green and you know the reaction should work. Um, one of the things we're wondering about, or we're trying to discuss with the collaborators is, it's a balance of the runtime. So at the minute, we're maybe thinking 48 hours. That's because during the whole of those 48 hours, you're detecting microbes. You might be detecting low amounts there, as you can see, after two days or after you know one and a half days. But the point is, lots of pathogens have low infective doses, and you just need you know you just need a few hundred of Campylobacter. So if you detect low amounts of it even after a day and a half, it's still very very important. So we might optimize the running time again with our collaborators, which you'll see who they are. What you want at the start is a thousand pores or more to be active if you haven't used your flow cell. So you basically know there you have lots of green, and green is an active pore within that flow cell that's detecting good quality DNA. So you can see there, you basically are detecting lots of qu good quality DNA, and over the runtime, it declines. This graph, basically, the the bottom are the field reads, but basically you can see there the top curve is a total number of reads, and then the curve beneath it are the ones that have passed, so you can see they correlate um, very well, and the ones that have failed are kind of based down at the bottom, which is what you want. Um, this again is how I know basically the, the Oxford Nanopore uh, baseline data, if you like, that I've got that the quality control is good because there's an Oxford Nanopore community and they provide a technical service and uh, technical support. So they've got instant messaging. So I sent them my slides and they, you know, I got feedback and they basically said, yes, it looks good and that you have good quality DNA. So again, if you want to join this community, Hector's joined it. I think Natalia has as well. So email me and I can add you onto the list of the community. It's a bit like ResearchGate in that you can see publications. There's kind of questions and answers as well from within the community to optimize your protocols. 
So it's a handy tool to have. And you'll see there there's, there's protocols. So basically within that, there's a long protocol with detailed explanations, and then there's shorter ones which have checklists that you complete as you're doing your experiments. And you write the details and the lot numbers of the flow cells and the stuff that you use so that you keep track. So, okay. Yeah. So this is, I'm just going to briefly talk through one experiment. This is one experiment just with 10 water samples collected from the stream and Korean canvas. So it's not drinking water. It's uh, raw, untreated surface water. Okay. So with each one of those 10 samples, I did uh, membrane filtration and for coliforms with chromocol agar. And basically, it had loads of it on it more than 100 CFUs per 100 mil. So the next analysis I did on six of the samples, uh, I used the Work Package 4 device that Jeremy's developed, and all six showed up positive after a few hours. So they matched the coliform monitoring. Um, one of the things Contouras really, really liked about this analysis was they can go in and get involved in it themselves in the software. So that exclude all, if you want to look at an uh, individual sample, you hit exclude all, and BC1 to 10 are your 10 individual samples. And what you would do would be just tick the one or two samples that you're interested in, or look at all of them. So the read counts are the counts of DNA. I didn't use equal amounts of DNA, so that's why they're slightly different. I just wanted to see what would happen if you looked at a range of concentrations. So for analysis going forward, we're going to look at at least 30 nanograms uh, per microliter for the sample analysis. So BC04 is the one that was uh, 30 nanograms per microliter. It had the most DNA. So you get the most read counts. So this just gives you an idea of the range of bugs that you detect, or microbes. Now the viruses are viruses within the bacteria. They're basically bacteria phase, like ones that you would get in E. coli or salmonella. But you get mostly bacteria and some yeasts, etc., as well, which you can see. So, so I manually checked each of the 10 samples and all of them had E. coli. So basically that correlates with the Work Package 4 device and also the coliform monitoring on the chromocult. Also, you can see on the bottom there some really pathogenic strains of E. coli as well. Yes, at low levels, but you still don't want them there. Compilobacter jejuni and coli are the main human Pathogens, or the well, the main types of uh, compilobacter associated with human illness. We detected those two. And you can see there as well, uh, Annie and Hector like this because you can see you can get a bit of information about the pathogen and kind of learn about it as well. And it's linked to um, a database where all sequencing of uh, microbes are deposited. Uh, you can see it's basically NCBI. Sorry, I should have should go back. One of the things you can do as well is um, you can basically search yourself for the different level of uh, identification. So you have species, genus, etc. too. So you can basically look and see what's there in quite a bit of detail. So Salmonella. And you can see there as well, those are some of the viruses I was talking about that had lower hits, but you wouldn't want again to Salmonella enterotica. Again, a well-known pathogen. You can see the information about it as well. And Clostridium. Again, you wouldn't want Clostridium botulinum. It's a well-known um, anaerobic pathogen. So that would be one that would be difficult to grow. It's anaerobic, um, so you need to, if you were to try and detect that by growth, you would need to grow that in an anaerobic cabinet. Uh, it wouldn't grow in oxygen. 
Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a um, opportunistic pathogen. So you can see there, lots of Pseudomonas um, was present. You would expect that in the environment, though in soils, etc., as well too. So um, this is a eukaryotic. So this is a yeast. It's not a bacteria, and again, an opportunistic um, pathogen. Um, linked with some gastroenteritis and illness, but um, mainly an opportunistic um, pathogen. And again, Cryptococcus, again, it's not a bacteria, but it just demonstrates that um, you don't just detect um, bacteria. So this again, you can look and see, this is just called a phylogenetic tree, but basically if two microbes are closer together, they're more closely related. So that just means um, a Syntobacter is more closely related to Pseudomonas than uh, it is to Burkholderia. So. so this is just an overall range of the pathogens that are detected from the 10 samples. The top are kind of grouped into opportunistic pathogens and the bottom ones are kind of gastroenteritis. So you can see there there's more than the ones that I mentioned, but that kind of demonstrates the power of the technique. Um, again, this is raw surface water, so no one's going to be drinking it, no one's going to be washing their clothes in it or cleaning with it, but it's still nice to see the power of the detection. I think one of the reasons why all these pathogens were detected was because during the two or three weeks, um, I collected the samples, slurry was being spread, which is a kind of type of manure in the fields, and it rained a lot, so it would have ran off from uh, fields in the area. There's a lot of agriculture close to our campus, so uh, you would have had a lot of that, and then also, you know, wild animals, foxes, badgers, feces from birds, etc. as well. So it does demonstrate the the power of the technology. So what we're thinking of um, for the Chappas region with um, Kintora Azul is over the next two years to look at up to 120 um, pooled cleaning and washing water samples from within the safe water um, communities, but it also ones that that aren't, and it will fit in with the Contourazul um, sampling policy. It'll fit into their workflow and uh, schedule. Um, so, from with, they'll sample one community at a time and collect samples. Uh, the type of samples will be, or the type of water will be from rivers, wells, springs, and storage tanks. We c well. From talking to Hector and Annie, most communities will have one or two of these, but not all of them. But whatever types they have for cleaning and washing um, water, we're going to collect um, those types and pull them together and then perform what I basically just said there, water quality analysis, uh, men-ion shotgun sequencing analysis, and up to 40 samples analyzed with the um, Work Package 4 device too. Um, we still, it is a very important um, route of exposure, even though it's, well, it's cleaning and washing water, but you have the, the potential for cross-contamination and still ingestion through, through um, poor hygiene practice. So there is um, still potential there for um, human illness, and it's an important um, route of transmission. And also, we're sure that we'll get um, enough DNA and be able to quantify it and look at the quality with um, the instrumentation at Igazur. One of the things we're conscious of is that increasingly, yes, this is water microbiome, but you need to include appropriate negative controls. So it's not just a case of using your elution buffer or just adding sterile water to the uh, flow cell to show that it's negative. You need to basically collect, uh, you need to autoclave water and 
pass it through the DNA extraction the way you would treat a sample and barcode it the same as if it was another sample and then establish your background contamination. Not contamination, sorry, your baseline, um, your baseline sequencing levels of the expected microbes that are there. So one of the things that we're quite excited about is we were thinking what's our actual goal. We want to establish baseline pathogen and seasonal data in the um, cleaning um, water. We think that the data will also inform work packages three, four, and five. You can kind of see maybe for work package five where the scenario where if you have clean water and the health measurements improve, but it's not as quite as much as you'd want or hope, maybe if there were lots of pathogens in the cleaning and washing water, that that could be, yes, it's kind of circumstantial evidence, but if you know the populations that are there, you know, there's a root of exposure there. Also, um, for work package four, obviously, we know if there's E. coli in the water, and coliforms. So if we basically get, you know, you'd expect that to correlate with the color change in the work package four device. And then obviously for work package three, um, we'll know what pathogens are in the water. So it could help with uh, treatment analysis, et cetera, as well. So one of the things I'd arranged before um, arranged to Mexico was bioinformatic analysis of all of the 120 samples. Now it was going to be over six months. You probably realized this was supposed to be an interactive uh, lab display. Well, Hector has some in eye on. So you need a good laptop. So we're fortunate that Hector has a good laptop. So basically that's so that the MinIron can work in real time and read the DNA sequences. So that's a spec that you need, and it's also available on the Oxford Nanobore website. Having a good um, laptop is a cheaper option than this. This is what we have in Korean. It's like an external hard drive that can run uh, MinIron as well. That's about 3,000 pounds. So for a limited budget, uh, a good laptop like Hector has would basically do the job. The costs, one of the things as well to consider is you do generate a lot of data. So you generate FAST5 and FASTQ files, which to be honest, I hadn't heard of before I started using the MinION, but the FASTQ files are the ones that bioinformaticians use. So one experiment generates about at least 80 gigabytes of data. So one of the things I made sure I got to Hector was a, a, a decent external hard drive to be able to save the data from the runs on. Uh, Hector did have to buy a membrane filtration pump. Uh, Ecosur and Corian does have a PCR thermal cycler, but you need that to label your DNA for the barcoding. And as I said, Corian and Hector have the DNA electrophoresis and the Nanodrop probe. Uh, we had a Vortex Genie. That's what you fit the adapter on to shake the samples. Uh, but Hector had to buy one. So you will have to probably invest in some equipment if you um, want to use them in ion. Again, the costs are, it depends. You're better off putting more money into the start and the starter packs because you get better offers. But basically, you can start off with $1,000 um, and you get one kit and two flow cells for that. Now, what you can do is, depending on your lab and your setup, you could analyze way more than 10 samples. You could analyze 100 or so. It's just for our, our application, we'd rather have shorter, you know, 10 sample block runs for Hector because it's easier for him and his team to handle. So again, the cost, well, the MinION costs are relatively fixed, um, but because of the problems we had trying to get MinION into Mexico, 
we thought we'd solved it with a distributor that Hector knew, but the problem then was they were looking for 35% of the cost. So basically, in most places in the world, uh, Oxford Nanopore have an arrangement with FedEx, and it's basically $50 per shipment, and normally your kits are done over two or three deliveries, and it's not that expensive. We're hoping with a new Mexican collaborator who can get stuff in a lot easier, we don't have to pay the 35%. So basically, the cost as well, and this is something I've learned through uh, Safe Water as well, I wasn't aware of this. In the UK, the costs of the reagents that you need for the DNA extractions and the filters, etc., are maybe one and a half to two times cheaper than they are, or less expensive than they are in Mexico. So basically, um, it's about £67 per sample if you do 120 samples, but that includes extraction and analysis, etc., as well with the Oxford Nanopore software. It doesn't include the bioinformatic analysis that you'll need to look at hundreds of samples. But as, I, as I've said, we've already arranged to have that um, through collaborators. In Mexico, because of the cost of the increased cost of um, consumables, it's more closer to 100 pounds. Um, obviously, I looked at doing this externally and the potential of performing DNA extractions and sending them to maybe companies and paying for it. But the problem is, even after you still do your own sample collection, membrane filtration, DNA extraction, and then you still need to do the quality control. And then even once you've done that, it was £200 per sample, at least for shotgun sequencing, to basically detect other things there besides bacteria. Um, so Minion, um, we think, is actually relatively good value. And why we like it as well is Hector and Annie and Contorazil can be involved with the software and learn about the pathogens as well. So it's nearly like an educational tool too. And they really like that. Um, the um, What's in My Pod Oxford Nanopore software that they could go in and see what Compilobacter was, Clostridium was, and learn a bit more about it and get a short description there. And they could go in and see themselves within blocks of 10 samples basically what each sample contained. Um, one of the other things about costs is the literature really recommends that you establish, if you buy a Minion into your institution, that you establish the sequencing platform, that you get training, and you establish your own protocol quality control. But the good thing is we've, kind of, we're, we've done that and are doing it with our collaborators, so if anyone else wants to get involved with Minion, it they don't, you know, we've established a quality control already. Oh, I just need to thank as well Safe Water and uh, SFAM for the grant and Contour as well for paying for the Minion analysis as well.